I'm joined by Yanis Varoufakis, acclaimed author, academic, former Greek finance minister. Yanis, welcome to Navarra Media. It's very good to be here. I think I interviewed you the last time before Jeremy Corbyn was Labour leader. So a lot has obviously changed. <laughs> yes, a hell of a lot. Fair to say. <laughs> Uh, before we go into the really deep intellectual stuff, a very simple question. Do you think Jeremy Corbyn will be the next Prime Minister? I always refuse, steadfastly, to issue predictions because I, this, this is an ideological stance. I don't think we have the right to predict. Because if you force me to come up with predictions about the future of humanity, socialism, the world, uh, you know, good manners, um, there is no evidence that things are going in the right direction. And then we'll all be gloomy and not find the energy we need in the morning to get out of bed. So, no predictions. Let's do what we must. I think that a, a Corbyn government is uh, the only way out. Firstly, the dog's Brexit process, and secondly, out of the broken business, po political and economic model of the, the United Kingdom. And it's something that we need as progressives from the other side of the pond. So let's work towards a Corbyn government and stop prognosticating. And do you think Brexit will happen? Do you think Britain will leave the European Union? I know you don't like predictions, but that obviously has to inform the strategy one adopts in the present. Some people think it's inevitable, therefore we should advocate oh, no, Brexit. There's no such thing as inevitability when it comes to political processes. It's what we do collectively that matters. This is why it's so important, I'll go back to what I was saying before, to, st to stop looking at it as a spectator sport. Democracy is not a, sp a spectator sport. It's what, you know, something we all participate in, especially when we pretend that we're not participating in it, because this is, you know, how apathy feeds into um, a variety of uh, sins. I, I think we're going to have a two-stage a, a two process. We're going to have a general election that will determine whether Johnson gets in with his hard Brexit idiocy, uh, or whether hard Brexit is off the table with the Corbyn government. And the Corbyn government is going to pass the button on to the British people to decide on whether they want a sensible deal to get out or to remain. And I think that is perfectly sensible. It's, it's, it's remarkable that these days, you know, moderate, sensible policies are being portrayed as radical. So if you had to give any advice to Jeremy Corbyn about what he's done right, what he's done wrong. What, what one piece of advice would you have as somebody who's been in government, who's had to confront really difficult challenges? Well, I think that Jeremy has been supremely sensible in the way that he's handled the whole Brexit process. This is a very unfashionable view. It's exactly the opposite of what the systemic media are trying to promote. If you think about it, uh, together we campaigned uh, in 2016 against Brexit on the basis that the EU sucks, it is wholly anti-democratic, it's full of problems, but huh, uh, it's the best of all available alternatives. Uh, exiting will push you, uh, that's what I was saying, into a Hotel California conundrum. Mm -hmm. You can check out any time you like, but you can never leave. Mm -hmm. uh, and also it will damage seriously uh, the lives, both economically and socially, and morally too, mm -hmm. of the weakest members of society. So even though we were very critical of the EU, mm -hmm. we campaigned to remain. And this was not ambiguity, this was a nuanced remain, a radical remain, we have to stay in the EU and try to change it from within. And after that, yeah, Jeremy acknowledged that the people of Britain, in their majority, voted to leave. Mm -hmm. So as a Democrat, he took this on board even though he was on the losing side. This, the fact that he respected the majority mm -hmm. was no sign that he was not serious about his remain position. And now you can see that the way that he has uh, um, guided the Labour Party towards a people's vote, um, it, 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 in the end, produces a greater probability of uh, the nation coming together, especially working people coming together, mm -hmm. who supported the different views. So I have no advice to give Jeremy. I think he's done a pretty good job. What I would have liked to, seen, to see uh, is something like a speech of hope for the UK. There's too much doom and gloom in this country. I consider Brexit to be, on the one hand, a major crisis, on the other hand, uh, a fantastic explosion of democratic energy that ne needs to be harnessed. And it needs to be harnessed by a leader that puts forward um, a vision of Britain in the next 10 years as a reformed country, a transformed country, a country that moves away from Thatcherism, a country that shows that it is possible to have a modern, technologically innovative, green, 
uh, agenda that is at the same time one of social justice and to paint a picture of a future relations between the UK, UK and the EU that is attractive to the British people. So a speech of hope would have been good to have. I hope we will have it soon. Secondly, I think that once he wins government, assuming he wins government, hoping that he wins government, I would like the referendum, the second referendum, mm -hmm. not to be the end of the road, but that it should be the beginning of a process of deep democratization with a series of constitutional assemblies that effectively pass the button on to the people of Britain mm -hmm. so that they can write down for the first time a progressive constitution by which to replace what has obviously broken down mm -hmm. the unwritten constitution so far. Mm -hmm. Labour's just announced this policy of foreign nationals being able to vote in general election. Mm -hmm. We probably agree it's a very good policy. How would you feel about one day perhaps being a, an MP in Britain yourself? <laughs> well, um, I would feel very much at home because look, I've spent a lot of time in this country. I cut my political teeth in this country. Yeah. I was in every picket line during the, the, the Thatcher years, uh, from the steel workers strike 1979 to uh, I spent the whole of 1984 that you know, heart-wrenching period during the miners' strike, going from Kent all to Yorkshire and so on, to, uh, Durham with uh, you know following the NUM. Uh, I was uh, at Wapping, um, watching the destruction of um, the typesetters' unions in the hands of Rupert Murdoch. So I, I feel that you know th this is my country as well. Mm -hmm. But I feel like this everywhere because I'm not a citizen of nowhere. I'm a citizen of Greece. Um, my anchor is in Greece, like you know. We all need to have an anchor, so as to be able to float freely, but not anchorlessly, uh, across um, different national borders. Uh, I don't think you need me here. I think you have very good comrades in Britain representing you in the House of Commons. What I think you do need is a parallel citizens' assembly process that feeds uh, the House of Commons with proposals, with in exactly the same way that, as in Ireland the Citizens' Assembly unlocked the question of uh, abortion rights, women's rights and so on. If they can do it in Ireland, you can do it here. Would you ever work for a Corbyn government? Maybe in the capacity of Governor of the Bank of England or a senior advisor? Obviously the first one's a bit more... There's no way bit, I would ever be a bit bigger job in a central bank because I, th I think I'm, I'm really not cut out for it. Uh, the central banker must remain quiet. There's not something I can do. <laughs> you can imagine. Can you imagine me not speaking out uh, and pretending to be uh, an impartial uh, monetary policy. Hasn't, hasn't that changed now? That now they need to give kind of like forward guidance as to what markets are going to be doing in the next three or four months? No, that's forward guidance. You could do that. But, but the whole point is not to say what you believe. <laughs> and in any case, I am a political animal. I, you know, I would very much like to, I, I will campaign on every campaign that matters to the working people of Britain. I will be here, like I am here today. But I'm, at the same time, I'm leading our political party in Greece. You have to remember that my fellow Greeks are still in uh, debtor's prison. Mm -hmm. We now have a toxic neoliberal government. Mm -hmm. uh, this week, actually on Wednesday, I'm come, going back to Parliament tomorrow in Athens to fight uh, the good fight against this government. They are giving to four or five um, oil companies, uh, effectively carte blanche, to drill across Greece, fracking, oil and gas, gas drilling in the Aegean, in the Ionian Sea, in the Eastern Mediterranean, together with Netanyahu's Israel, together with ExxonMobil, to, together with the dictatorship of Egypt, you know, President Sisi. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so the, the fight is international, it happens everywhere. Uh, each one of us must uh, um, concentrate the energy uh, while also helping everybody else where they can be most effective. But do you not think that, you said you wouldn't like the job yourself, but do you not think that in general, um, people are, who are heading up central banks should be political? I mean, but the they are political. To, yeah, exactly, but, exactly, but the point... But claim, pretending they, that they're not political. The claim to they are, impartiality... They, are, they become reactionary. Precisely, but the claim and to... I'm not going to be one of them. Precisely, but <laughs> the point is, surely if we were to have a, a socialist government who was honest about the role of monetary policy and finance within transitioning an economy to a more green, just, sustainable way of doing things, 
that quote unquote impartiality, which is not impartiality, it's an ideological veil for a certain kind of politics, we'd get rid of that. And so it might not be you, but it might but be somebody else. You can't get rid of it. As a, uh, if you accept the contract of a supposedly independent central banker, you cannot change that kind of contract. You know, you've just accepted it. You've, you've been bound by it. What John McDonald is going to do, I know that about that, and this is what I'm very, very happy doing, helping John McDonald, working with John McDonald, we've been friends, we're comrades. Uh, DiEM25, our pan-European movement and the Labour Party are already planning a, a conference that we will co-sponsor in Brussels in January to start uh, effectively a progressive international um, that has an agenda for Europe and for the world for transforming central banking, transforming finance, uh, transforming the rules of the game for multinationals, tax evasion and so on. This is how we're going to change central banking. Because central banking now is going through a massive crisis. Mm. Uh, effectively, the central banks have... Uh, it's a bit like be being a pilot in a, in a jet, um, in a, you know aircraft, and finding out that the levers don't work. Uh, now the, the levers have ceased working. Mm -hmm. uh, you look at the Central Bank of Europe, look at the Fed, look at the Bank of England. Mm -hmm. There is no, they are trying to inflate the economy, they are, they are failing to do so. Mm -hmm. Which, you know, it's, it's unbelievable. It's like jumping out of an airplane and realizing that you are floating and you are not falling. Uh, why? Because capitalism, after the 10 years of the post-2008 crisis, is now morphing into a deflation, um, a deflation machine. A machine that is producing a great deal of wealth for the wealthy. Uh, a lot of money, liquidity, but no investment. Uh, so a Labour government is necessary here, a MERA government in Greece, progressive governments around the world, we need to bind together in order to create effectively a new financial order. We need to move towards post-capitalism post when it comes to property rights. Already John McDonald today, I heard him announce a policy that we've been working on as well with DiEM25 and we've been discussing this with John and the Labour Party of shifting property rights to workers. You know, shares, a minimum of shareholding going to, to workers, I would say go to society. Mm -hmm. So you have a universal basic div dividend and at the same time transforming the role of money and international money, replacing the dollar uh, from being the international currency with something much clearer, uh, uh, clearer much nearer to what uh, John Maynard Keynes was talking about in 1944, international clearing union. Which for people watching was what Keynes wanted with the Bretton Woods arrangements, the Americans broadly agreed, with the exception of the dollar being the global reserve currency. That's right. And, and now you have a choice between Trump and Trump's strategy of maintaining the exorbitant privilege of the dollar or a mutualization of money uh, by a progressive, internationally minded uh, coalition of, uh, of states. What kind of chance did you think John McDonald would be? Because obviously prior to 2015, People who are aware of him in the commentariat within policy circles will say this is literally the last kind of person we want to be running the UK economy. And yet now he's actually more popular with the Financial Times, the City of London, with CEOs. Isn't that astonishing? Than Jeremy Corbyn. And so, yeah, that's, that's the question to me is let's, let's cherish the, you know, the, 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 the small nuggets of pure joy that we can get out of a very difficult period internationally, a eh? period of Bolsonaro, Trump, and so on. This is wonderful to watch John McDonnell being painted by the Financial Times as the, you know, the best of the lot, yeah. the lesser evil. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a major victory. Well done, John. Do you, think, do you think that goodwill will sustain on impact of, of taking office? No. And do you think... No, okay. of course not. <laughs> they, 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 the, the character assassination uh, um, process is, is going to, to, to start again. The moment he starts taxing the rich, the moment he starts uh, doing things that uh, undermine the monopoly power of the oligarchs or oligopoly power of the oligarchs. Uh, but that's okay. He, you know, John is quite a seasoned campaigner. He expects it. Mm. What matters is to maintain the link, the bond, with the people, with the voters. Um, we have shown, both here in Britain, but also us in Greece, mm. that it's perfectly possible to bypass the media, uh, the establishment media, and mm. through media, media like yours, uh, and direct contact to re-establish a connection with the people directly. I guess the greatest manifestation of that was the Occhi vote. That's right. I think, I mean, that was just a there remarkable... 62% against every single television station, radio station and newspaper in Greece. And our little party that got into, into Parliament now, mm. we, that, that was a similar phenomenon. Uh, we were vilified and demonised by every single mass medium there is.
quickly on Greece, I don't want to sort of stick on that point too much because you've talked about Syriza at great length and we've got so much to get through. Um, thinking about the Yoki vote and the opportunity that created, not just for Syriza, but for a renewal of Greek democracy, of And Greek for you folks, for everybody. Well, yeah, of course. Everybody was looking at what yeah. we were doing. Yeah, yeah. In the same way that the Europe was looking at the storming of Bastille as uh, the dawning of a, of a new day. Yeah. Do you think that capitulation by Syriza around the third agreement that was ultimately hashed out with the Troika, uh, do you think that capitulation was the end of something or the beginning of something? Because obviously you seem quite an optimistic person, you're presently engaged in electoral politics once more, but as a part of you think this could have played out very differently with Syriza, with Tsipras, and from what you're saying, it could have had historic implications and it was a missed opportunity. It was, it was. Uh, I'm, I never read my book, I will never read it again for, over the period, for that period, mm -hmm. because it's so saddening. It was a fantastic opportunity. It was a fantastic, we, we, you know, the jailbreak had succeeded. We were about to run into the fields, away from the concentration camp. And our leader asked us to, you know, shepherded us back into the concentration camp. But, to answer the first part of your question, it's both. It's both an end and a beginning, because there's no such thing as final defeat or a final victory, as Tony Benn used to say. Mm -hmm. um, every generation is condemned to fight the good fight again mm -hmm. and again and again. And what makes us um, capable of writing history is this capacity uh, to continue fighting along the lines of, you know, the interests of the many. And what could Labour learn from that capitulation? Because obviously it's perfectly possible that Labour go into government, that there is a bump in popularity, people like the programme, but then Labour, in whatever way, don't necessarily deliver on the goodwill that gets them there in the first place. What can Labour, the people around Jeremy Corbyn, learn from the experience of Syriza and Tsipras? The 2015, the crashing of the Greek Spring, as some of us refer to that episode, it's a great opportunity for the Labour Party to revisit its own roots. Because what we had in Greece in the summer of 2015, the Labour Party experienced it in 1926 with Ramsay MacDonald. So don't repeat Ramsay MacDonald. Because what the establishment will try to do is they will try, it's not easy for them to overthrow government in total. But what they will try to do is they will target the key figures in the government which they consider to be the linchpins of the government anti-austerity program. And they will, try, they, they, they will indulge in a project of character assassination. And, if, and the media are going to be saying, oh look, you've, if, if you're going to save your government, you have to get rid of these people. Uh, and this is what they were doing in Greece as well. That's what they were doing in, in the 1920s with the Labour Party back then. So that the government is emasculated, uh, maybe you bring in some Lib Dems in order to temper it and effectively to turn it into a Tory government with the Labour uh, branding intact in order to justify doing terrible things to the working class in the name of Labour. So do you depart ways then a little bit with somebody like a Paul Mason who says that the, 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 the politics of the present conjuncture, the rise of the far right, uh, a huge task ahead in transforming the British economy in particular, which has really profound problems, just as Greece does, but those two countries have much bigger problems than, say, Greece or Germany. Something like Paul would say, well, to do that, you need a grand coalition, you need a, uh, an alliance, a popular front, which would include Liberal Democrats, would inc include Scottish and Welsh nationalists, don't include Greens. No way. The so you don't agree with Paul The Lib Dems must be condemned to being treated with maximum contempt forever. They are the ones that effectively uh, allowed David Cameron to impose austerity and uh, to usurp even liberal values. So the Lib Dems, um, if there's any justice in this world, mm. will go nowhere near government, and especially they will not go near government on the coattails of, a, of, a, of the Labour Party and Corbyn's Labour Party. Yes, we do need a coalition, but the Labour Party is the coalition. The Labour Party is a broad church. Uh, that doesn't mean that you don't um, strike uh, deals or you have a good understanding with people like Caroline Lucas here in Brighton from the Green Party, with the Scottish National Party. Absolutely, absolutely. But uh, you draw a line somewhere. And I think that the line needs to be drawn um, on the question of austerity and the, on the question of property rights. 
Anyone who challenges the need to reverse decades of austerity, and anybody who challenges the need to shift property rights from the few to the many, should, should simply have no place in such a coalition. So you're reversing privatisation, the Liberal Democrats disagree, you should They're out. They're out. Let them, you know, hobnob with Johnson. They deserve it. It's interesting because I was speaking to Vince Cable yesterday and... But he's not a Lib Dem. He's just a nice guy who f fell off the cart of the Lib Dems. Well, that's the thing. Probably Vince Cable, <laughs> before the financial crisis, during the financial crisis... Ask him to join the Labour Party. Well, he, was, well, he can't now because he's obviously destroyed his perfectly that's decent right. reputation. That's right. But what was interesting was, look, and he was talking about um, proportional representation, getting rid of the House of Lords, all the constitutional measures you've talked about. And I said, the only way you're ever going to deliver on this is with a Labour-led government. And yet your successor, Joe Swinson, has said categorically, she won't work with Jeremy Corbyn. So I wonder... And his predecessor, Nick Clegg, yeah. went to do bed with David Cameron yeah. and put, pulled poor Vince Cable into a government that was implementing the worst kind of austerity, tripling to the trebling of, the, of, of, of uh, students' fees and so on and so forth. So, you know, we are, in the end, we are responsible for our deeds. But what I want to ask really is, when you have even a, a relatively principled liberal like um, Vince Cable, and he's talking about all these things, but it seems to me the Liberal Democrats don't even really care about electoral reform. All we need, need to do is, you know, if I were a Jeremy, I would bump him up to the House of Lords and ask him to sit with uh, the Labour peers. What do you think it says more generally about liberalism today? And I suppose that's the last question. It's dead. It's a dead ideology. It's, it's, I mean, not liberalism. Yeah. The liberals' liberalism. Yeah. Because they betrayed it. They introduced, Nick Clegg was responsible for introducing hugely anti-liberal legislation. Legislation that denied people, you know, people are on remand, their basic habeas corpus rights. So when the Liberal Party, it's a bit like Syriza in Greece. When the, 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 the coalition of the radical left cuts the lowest pensions that there are, mm. um, privatizes everything, mm. <laughs> uh, and imposes huge stringent austerity, mm. it seems to be, it's not that the left has failed, it's not that the, that the socialism has died as an idea, it's that this party is no longer um, able uh, to, to, to be counted as part of the left. Similarly, I mean, I think that liberalism is, is always going to be with us. And you know, I have a libertarian stick in me. Mm. And I think that you know, Karl Marx had one too. You can't be a, a believer in the emancipation of the working class, of women, of blacks, of minorities, and not be a liberal. Emancipation is, is a liberal uh, and even libertarian project. Mm. But the Lib Dems have abandoned liberalism a long time ago. So you think that people that believe in those values who would think themselves liberals should just join the Labour Party? Yes, indeed. Well, on that note, <laughs> it's a grand coalition, but it's also all inside one party. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I hear you've got a book out next year on science fiction. Yes, I am writing a political science fiction treatise, which is giving enormous pleasure. Because, you know, politics is, 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 is a tough business and also quite soul destroying. So you need to have something. You know, for me, when I write my, my science fiction book, which is actually taking place in Brighton in 2035. Wow. Um, this is going to be a Netflix series in 10 years' time. Yeah, you know, I hope so. Uh, suddenly, I transport myself to another world, and I am completely revived. Well, on that note, I look forward to reading it next year. Thank you very much, Anderson. Thank you. Thanks very much.